Church, I invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. I want to thank Pastor Rick for doing such a wonderful job this morning, just helping us worship in light of Palm Sunday. I'm going to go the exact opposite uh, direction and talk nothing about Palm Sunday. So I am a huge failure, but that's okay. It's not about me. We're going to return to 1 Peter chapter 3 with God's instruction concerning wives. We continue to make our way through this epistle written by Peter to believers living in the first century. Last week we started by looking at one word. We spent an entire sermon examining that one word, wives, and placing it within its historical context. And we discovered that it was a time, that is when Peter was writing, it was a time and a context that was tragically um, unloving, unkind, disrespectful of women. The culture and the context, they treated women much worse than we do in our Western world and we have a long way to go ourselves. And so we praise God that Jesus, when he invaded invaded our planet the first time here, the first Jesus um, event, we praise God that Jesus rose above his culture and the context in which he lived. He did not settle for the cultural norms. Instead, he really changed the way women are treated And that's had lasting impact even into our day. Now, some have wondered where they could find some of the primary source material for the quotes that I gave last week. And rather than sending you to all of those primary sources as as individual sources, I want to recommend to you one book. It's a pretty good book. It's not the best book in the whole world, but it's got a lot of primary sources when it comes to this particular issue. It's written by Alvin Schmidt. It's called Under the Influence. Alvin Schmidt is a professor of sociology, or he was until he retired there in the state of Illinois, and he has one chapter on this particular subject, how Christ and Christianity influenced the world for the better when it came to the treatment, the love, the respect of women. And his chapter on the subject has a plethora of primary as well as secondary uh, sources for you to look into. So I would commend that to you if you are one of those folks that like to do research and are looking for primary sources. Well, great. Let's pray and we are going to begin our study in 1 Peter 3, chapter 1. Father, this morning we pray and pause. Lord, with just a heightened sense of sensitivity, a heightened sense of reverence to you, a heightened sense to Christ and the people who shouted Hosanna one day and crucified him a few days later, we come to you with a heightened sense of this touchy subject of wives and their relationship to husbands And so, Lord, I pray that I would not get in the way at all of what you would have communicated, communicate that which you want to communicate to these folks, your precious saints. Lord, work in each of our hearts, our minds, that you would stir us to honoring and following Christ in all we do. Amen. Amen. This morning, we are going to progress a little bit farther in our study of 1 Peter chapter three. We're going to make it all the way through the end of the first clause of the first verse. (laughs) We read in first Peter chapter three, verse one, likewise, wives be subject to your own husbands. Likewise, wives be subject to your own husbands. And you might be asking yourself, why in the world would we spend an entire sermon on this? It's because it's that important. Now, Martha Peace, who wrote on the subject of wives submitting to their husbands in the book, The Excellent Wife, 
a book I understand some are fans of and some are not. Well, there's things that I found very helpful in the book. She, write, she writes this, quote, here is a word of caution. Most Christian wives believe themselves to be submissive to their husbands. However, if their husbands were asked if they are submissive, they would likely say no. So who's wrong? Are the wives right in saying that they are submissive to their husbands? Are the husbands right in saying that the, the wives don't? Is there a little truth to both sides? You see, there is a lot of confusion in our day regarding this area of wives being submissive to their, sub, to their, to their husbands. As a matter of fact, it's almost taboo to talk about it. Not only is there confusion, there's also fear. Wives are confused and wives are a bit afraid regarding text like, the text like this. They're afraid of what it may mean for them, practically speaking, if they submit to their husbands and the wishes and the desires of their husbands willingly come under their leadership. The husbands at the same time are also confused and afraid. They're afraid to lead because it may anger their wives. Most husbands know they're lousy leaders. And so they're afraid. Sometimes it's just plain easier to let a wife do whatever she wants rather than face the consequences. And it's been my observation over the years that there's probably a lot more fear than there is confusion regarding this issue of submission. Sure, there is some confusion. And so we need instructed by God's word. And that's certainly what we will do this morning. We will sit under the teaching of God's word. But more often than that, in our culture, there is more fear surrounding submission than there is confusion. We are afraid of submission. Wives are afraid to submit because of what it might cost them. Husbands are afraid to expect submission out of their wives because of what it might cost them. Pastors are afraid to teach on submission because of what it might cost them. And I find myself especially afraid this morning. Perhaps for another reason. Because of the week that we find ourselves in. You see, I know people, I know crowds. They're more than willing to stand up and sing Hosanna. Glory to God. But when they hear from him, they say crucify him. So it's with much fear this morning that I say thus saith the Lord. Wives, submit to your husbands. Wives, be subject to your own husbands. Now, this phrase, be subject, here in verse 1, it is the same Greek word, hupotasso, that we've looked at in chapter 2, verse 13. And be subject, for the Lord's sake, to every human institution. 
It's also the same word that we ran into in chapter 2, verse 18. Servants, be subject, hupitasso, your masters. It's what we call an imperative there in chapter 2, verse 13. In chapter 2, verse 18. In chapter 3, verse 1, it's a participle with imperatival force. What does that mean? It means that these are commands. And here in chapter 3, verse 1, it means that this is God's command. This is God's law for wives. And let me tell you something. Here at Cornerstone, we love grace. We love the grace that God provides for us when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We love the truth that the gospel gives us, that God does not treat us as our sins deserve, but he treats us with grace. He treats us as if we were Jesus himself. We love grace. But friends, let us not lose balance. We need to love the law. Psalms, Palms, it's Palm Sunday. Psalms 19. Thinking about how this, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, it's the law, it's the commandment of the Lord to wives. Let me just remind you of what the psalmist said in Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect. Wives, this is perfect. It revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is pure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. This is more desirable than gold even much fine gold, sweeter than honey. Moreover, by them, these words, these commandments, your servant, that's you, your servant is warned. And in keeping them, there is a great reward. Who can discern his own errors? Declare me innocent and hidden in faults, from hidden faults. And he says, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Keep us from breaking your law, even though we know it's your law. Keep us from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Let me not have the, let these desires, these passions to transgress your law and break your law and rely solely on, well, we should rely solely on his grace, but we shouldn't sin so that grace can abound, right? Isn't that Paul's whole argument in Romans? Keep us from these things. Then the psalmist says, I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. This is law. This is going to be hard. It's going to be tough to listen to. But it's perfect. It's good. It's what we need. Generally speaking, this command to be subject refers to submitting oneself to someone who holds a higher rank than you do. It's a military term that refers to a person obeying the orders of their commanding officer. Hupitasso is used repeatedly in the New Testament, and that teaches us that God is clearly a God of order. He is a God who uses the means of authority and authoritative relationships to establish order here on planet Earth. For there to be order in this world, we need leaders and we need followers. We need those with authority and those who will submit to that authority. Hupitasso is used of the submission of Jesus, Jesus submitting to the authority of his parents. The God of the world 
coming under the authority of his mom and dad. Luke 2, verse 51. It's used of demons being subject to the authority of the disciples in Luke chapter 10, verse 17. Hupatasso is used of citizens. As we've learned here in second, or first Peter chapter two, of citizens coming under the authority of government. Hupatasso is used of the universe being subject to the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. It's used that way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 27, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. Hupatasso is used of unseen spiritual powers, demons, being subject to the authority of Christ. 1 Peter 3.22. It's used of Christ being subject to the authority of God the Father. 1 Corinthians 15.28. It's used of church members being under, being subject to the authority of church leadership. 1 Corinthians 16.15-16. 1 Peter 5.5. 5, and it's taught the same principle in Hebrews 13.17. Hupatasso is used of the church being under the authority of Jesus Christ, Ephesians 5.24. It's used of servants being under the authority, being subject to their earthly masters. We saw that in 1 Peter 2, but it's also taught in Titus 2.9 with Hupatasso. Hupatasso is used of Christians submitting to the preferences of one another. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. It's used of Christians being subject, submitting to the divine authority of God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9, and James 4, 7. And of course, all that leading up to, Hupatasso is used of wives coming under the authority, being subject to their husbands. This is God's divine order. Colossians 3, verse 18. Wives, hupatasso, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Titus 2, 5. Older women teach the younger women to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and hupatasso, submissive to their own Husbands, Ephesians 5, 22, wives, hupatasso, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Ephesians 5, 24, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should hupatasso submit in everything to their husbands. I'm so glad well, never mind. We won't even say it. When it comes, when it comes to the context of the husband and the wife relationship, the Greek word hupotazo, it's, it's defined as wives, a wife's willingness to submit, to obey her husband and the authority that he doesn't necessarily, that he doesn't deserve, but that God has given to him for the sake of order. I want to tell you, looking back at verse 1 here, it's very significant that Peter starts this verse with the word likewise. Do you see that? Likewise. Eh, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. What this does is it points us back to the submission that he's already talked about in chapter 2. Likewise, this submission is Similar, It shares similarities. Therefore, likewise, you should submit. How are they similar? Because there are definitely ways that they are different. How are they similar? Well, I want to suggest to you three ways. One, they're similar in motive. The submission is similar in motive. Just as we are all to submit to every human institution for the Lord's sake, so two wives are submit to submit to the institution of marriage for the Lord's sake. Being mindful of God is how he put in chapter two, verse 19. So they're similar in motive. They're also similar, secondly, in extent. The call to submission is far reaching. I would say all 
inclusive to those whom Peter is writing to. For example, in the case of servants, they were to hupotasso, submit to not only their good and gentle masters, but also to what? The unjust ones, the crooked ones. The call to submit to those masters was far reaching. Similarly, wives, the call to submit here is far reaching in its extent. We can assume through a simple language tool called ellipsis that what Peter has in mind here is that, even though he doesn't write it, that wives are to submit to good husbands, just as slaves master, were to submit even to good masters. But at the same time as chapter one sa- or verse one here in chapter three says, wives are to be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they're disobedient to the word. So similarly, just like when it came to obeying every human institution and submitting to servants to their masters, wives, the extent is far reaching. We're gonna talk more about that in two weeks. Next week, of course, is being Easter. We're gonna talk a little bit more about Easter stuff next week. Thirdly, they're similar in attitude. Attitude, the submission needs to carry with it the same attitude. When Peter here addresses in chapter two the call to submit to every human institution, he uses the term phobos, referring to God. It's the end of chapter, or verse 17, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, phobos, fear God, honor the emperor. That's his summary in submitting to every human institution. He uses the word again in verse 18, directed at servants. He says, be subject to your masters with all phobos, respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. And here he says, wives, likewise, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your phobos, your respectful and pure conduct. The word phobos here does not necessarily mean phobia. There is an aspect of fear. It's a healthy desire to avoid the displeasure of the person who you are to submit to. It's It's a healthy, I should say, a healthy desire to avoid the displeasure of the authority in your lives. Respectful conduct is how It's translated here in verse two. And so the call for wives to be subject to their husbands is similar to these earlier calls to be subject in regards to, in regards to their motives. Wives, your motives should follow suit to the extent it's far reaching, this command, the law of God in your life, wives. And it's also similar with attitude that is this healthy desire to avoid the displeasure of the person in authority over you. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. Wives, putting it all together now, wives, for the Lord's sake, being mindful of him, avoid your husband's displeasure by submitting to him regardless of whether he's likable or lame, obedient or disobedient. That's the meaning. That's the meaning of the text. It's also why I am thankful this is Palm Sunday and not Tomato Sunday. Because that's not a popular word. So let me make a couple of comments, and I'm not trying to soften the blow here at all. In just a moment, I'm going to give you with five additional biblical principles to kind of help us further along our understanding 
of this command to be submissive. Lord willing, that will really help draw some lines and will provide you some healthy guidelines, wives, as you seek to honor the Lord in this. But first, let me say this. When I'm done preaching this morning, this is going to feel incomplete. It's not going to feel like you've gotten the whole story. It's because you haven't. I'm not going to address men today. I will. <laughs> but that's not who this text is written to. And there's a sense in which, wives, you are literally in the crosshairs this morning. And it's very tempting for me to soften the blow because I love you women. But I'm not going to. Nor do I think you would want me to. You love the Lord. You want to be his servant. You want to honor him. And so... I cherish the opportunity to teach you hungry, spiritually hungry wives who want to honor the Lord in this. Now, I will tell you this. Men, I'm coming for you. <laughs> as a husband, as I study this and as I put the weight of the law on my wife, I'm crushed that she has to follow a guy like me. And we're going to find out when we get down here to verse 7, when he changes directions and he talks to you husbands, that if you do not take into consideration all that I'm going to tell the wives, if you don't have compassion towards her, if you do not feel sorry for her, that she is under your leadership, and I'm sure you're great leaders, don't get me wrong, but still, if that does not move you to be the best, godly, caring, loving, compassionate, listening, concerned husband, then you are in big trouble. You are the disobedient husband that he's talking about here in verse one. A marriage where a woman has to come under a man's leadership, better be the best, safest, most rewarding atmosphere you can provide. Or else you are failing men. And let me just say one more thing. Wives, your call to be submissive to your husbands that doesn't relegate, that's not doormat theology. That doesn't relegate you to an opinionless woman. <laughs> Men, you would be fools if you did not highly consider your wife's counsel in every single decision you make. Will the decision I make here honor her? Will it show her love? Will it protect her? her? Will it make her feel safe? Will it draw us closer? This is not some sort of dictatorship in which you get a slave in your wife. Nothing could be the further from the picture of what Christ paints for us in marriage. Remember, marriage, according to Ephesians 5, is to be the most beautiful, prevalent example of the gospel to this world because Christ has married whom? The bride, the church. The gospel is to be displayed in our marriages. It's to be a billboard of what love and security and peace and compassion looks like. So that's that. Five principles. Five biblical principles to help us get our minds a little bit more around this idea of wives 
submitting to their husbands. This first one I talked a little bit about last week. We'll bring it up again because it needs to be said. Principle number one, women are equal to men in the eyes of God. And I'm gonna tell you right now, that's the only eyes that matter. Women are equal to men in the eyes of God, but they have been given a different role by God. They have been given a different role. As I've already mentioned, the Greek word hupotasso is a military term, which means to be ranked under someone else who has a higher level of authority. And of course, the brave men and women of our country who serve us in the military, the armed forces, they are absolutely equal to one another and they share in the same civil rights. However, in order for our military to function effectively, different people are given different rank. They're given different authority. And the same is true of the God-ordained institution of marriage. God has given the highest authority in a marriage to the husband. We need to be careful with statements like that. I hope what I've already said kind of prefaces enough that just because you have the highest authority doesn't necessarily mean that you are the smartest men or that you're the wisest in this two-person relationship or that you have the best ideas. What it does mean is that you men will be held accountable for the decisions. While a wife has been given a different rank, a different position, she is not an inferior person. Romans 12, 11, for God shows no partiality. Galatians 3, 27 through 29 tells us that the people who are baptized into Christ, that there is now, therefore, neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. We all share the perfection of Christ. We've all been given that inheritance where Abraham's offspring, verse 29 says, according to the promise of God. God does not favor males over females. God absolutely favors both sexes. And as such, God knows that it is best to have order in the home. And so he's given different roles, different ranks, different positions to the husband and the wife. The husband is to lead the home and the woman, the husband's equal, is to come under his authority and leadership by being subject to him. So in the eyes of God, women are absolutely equal to men, but have been given a different role in the marriage relationship. Principle number two. Principle number two. A wife is to be submissive to her husband in all things. A wife is to be submissive to her husband in all things, comma, unless he asks her to sin. Unless he asks her to sin. I've already made mention to it, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24. It's a parallel passage to our text this morning. There God tells us, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Ephesians 5.24. This is one of those cases where everything means everything. You mean like everything, everything? I mean like everything, everything. Wives should submit in everything to their husbands. What if my husband sets the family budget and tells me that I can't buy this thing that I really want to buy? Wives, be subject to your husbands 
in everything. Well, what if he tells me to discipline the kids for not cleaning their room, but I really don't think it's necessary. I'm more of a reward kind of a person. Wives, submit to your husbands in everything. What if he expects me to have a full-time job and homeschool the kids and make all the meals and keep the house clean and do the dishes? Well, it sounds to me like your husband's an idiot. (laughs) But until you come in and talk to us and we readjust his expectations, wives, be subject to your husband's in everything. So pastor, you're telling me I have to submit to my husband in everything? No, I'm not. God is. Unless, of course, your husband is asking you to sin. If he's asking you to sin, then you must submit to God rather than men. Because God is a higher authority. He is the highest authority in your life. And your husband is down here. You must obey God rather than men. As the apostles put it in Acts chapter 5 verse 29. Here's where things get a bit tricky. Because we like to pull the... I don't say we because I'm a man. But... I've seen it happen time and time again where the wife likes to pull out the card. Well, I think he's asking me to sin. He's asking me to go against my conscience. Well, we need to have a pretty clear case, ladies, if you're going to pull the card out that he is asking you to sin. He's your leader. Let me give you a couple of clear-cut examples of a husband asking you to sin. One, he forbids you from attending church on the Lord's day. That'd be asking you to sin. That would be breaking the fourth commandment. That would be breaking Hebrews 10, 25, where the Lord tells you to not forsake the assembling together of his people. So you must not obey such a request. Another example of him asking you to sin. He forbids you from talking to your children about God. Well, according to the book of Proverbs, especially chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, it is a mother's duty to talk to her children about the Lord, to instruct her children in the ways of the Lord. Here's another example. Your husband wants you to get, all right, your husband wants you to engage in immoral behavior. Maybe he wants you to look at some things on the internet that aren't appropriate, spice things up. This is another clear case of a husband asking his wife to sin. Hebrews 13, 4, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. Here's another example. Your husband's asked you, your husband has asked you to to kind of go along with his illegal scheme. He's asked you to not turn him into the authorities for breaking the law. He's done something wrong. He's asking you to help cover it up. Wives, you cannot help your, wife, your husbands in your, his evil schemings. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are abomination to him. Let me read a couple of them to you. A lying tongue, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil and a false witness. Wives, you cannot cooperate in your husband's illegal activities. A wife is to be submissive to her husband in all things unless her husband asks her to sin. So, (laughs) I'm going to bring this book into play right now. This is a book that has, I found, to be somewhat helpful when it comes to wives submitting to their husbands. It's written by a woman, Martha Peace. It's called The Excellent Wife. As we're talking about wives being subject to your husbands in all things, she 
gives this list of specific ways that wives are not submissive. And I'm just dumb enough to read them to you. Rapid fire, here we go. Specific ways wives are not submissive. She does things that are annoying or vexing to her husband. Proverbs 21, 19, it is better to live in a desert land than with a contentious and vexing woman. What's a vexing woman? It's a, a woman who is defined as being irritating, annoying, puzzling, baffling, bothersome, and will debate at length. Number two, she does not discipline the children as she should, even as her husband asks her to. Proverbs 29, 15, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. Number three, she is more loyal to others than to her husband. Proverbs 31, 11 describes the wife and her husband, the heart of her husband trust in her. Number four, she argues or pouts or gives way, or I'm sorry, she argues or pouts or gives him the cold shoulder when she does not get her own way. Proverbs 21, nine, it is better to live in a corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Why do I feel the need to start ducking behind the pulpit? I'm just kidding. You guys are, I'm, that's just, that's joking. All right, I'm sorry if that's inappropriate. Number five, she does not stay within the limits of their budget. Proverbs 19.11, house and wealth are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. Number six, she corrupts, I'm sorry, corrects, she corrects, interrupts, talks for her husband, and is too outspoken when others are around. Proverbs 27, 15, and 16. A constant drip, dripping on a day of steady rain and a contentious woman are alike. He who restrains her restrains the wind and grasps oil with his right hand. That's saying that if you can control a woman like that, you are a miracle worker. <laughs> Number seven. She manipulates him to get her own way. She may manipulate by deceit, tears, begging, nagging, complaining, anger, or intimidation. And very insightfully, she includes here Luke 10, 40, where Martha tried to manipulate Jesus. Listen to these words. Jesus, don't you care that my sisters left me alone to, to, to make the meal, to prepare the meal? Jesus, don't you care? Number eight, she makes important decisions without consulting him. 1 Corinthians eleven three, 3, I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and the man is the head of the woman. Number nine, she directly defies his wishes. 1 Samuel 15, 23, for rebellion is as the sin of divination and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Number 10, she worries about the decisions he makes and takes matters into her own hands. Philippians 4, 7, and 8, be anxious for nothing, but in everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Finally, number 11, she does not pay attention to what he says. Here she quotes James 1, verse 19, that everyone is to be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger. Let me just read this last summary paragraph. She says, submission is the way that all Christians should respond to the Lord and the way that the wife should respond to her husband. 
She can respond with tenderness, gentleness, gentleness, and gracious obedience, or she can respond with harshness or irritation. In the areas where you know you have failed, you should take a few moments and confess your sins to the Lord. Then go to your husband and ask his forgiveness. It may be best for you to be specific and give examples. Your attitude should be humble, focusing at this time on what you have done wrong. You can begin today to be a gentle, godly, submissive wife to your husband. Biblical principle number three. A submissive wife ultimately seeks to honor the Lord in her marriage, thereby blessing her husband. A submissive wife ultimately seeks to honor the Lord in her marriage, thereby honoring, blessing her husband. Again, it doesn't matter if you're married to Prince Charming or to Gargamel from the Smurfs. A wife is called to honor the Lord, even in her marriage. And as she does that, she will be a blessing to her husband. A couple of ways in which a wife honors the Lord in her marriage. One, when she submits to her husband, even when she doesn't feel like it. John 14, 23. When she thinks true and right and praiseworthy thoughts of her husband. Philippians 4, 8. A wife honors the Lord in her marriage when she appropriately and lovingly reproves her husband when he's in sin, when he could do things better. It's not being a pushover, it's loving him by making suggestions lovingly, privately. I mean, the rules of Matthew 18 apply to even your husband, the husband-wife relationship. If your brother, if your husband, if your wife sins against you, go to that person in private. A wife honors the Lord in her marriage when she doesn't keep a list of wrongs done by her husband, holding them against him. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Love does not add up wrongdoing. A wife honors the Lord in her marriage by bringing her husband a blessing if he does, even if he does, evil against her. 1 Peter 3, 9. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. A wife honors the Lord in her marriage when she patiently endures difficult times, even when they are brought on by the, her husband. Again, we read in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, that love endures all things. Of course, a wife honors the Lord and shows love for her husband as well when she prays for him. Pray for one another is what James counseled us to do in James chapter 5, verse 16. As a wife seeks to love the Lord more, it will bless her husband. Number four, we got to move quick. A wife, I only have two more. A wise wife, she will seek training and counsel on submission from godly older women. A wise wife, she'll seek training, discipleship, on this subject from godly older women. In Titus chapter two, verses three through five says, older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands that the word of God may not be reviled. Listen, young wives, you should seek out older, wiser, reverent ladies that will help you succeed in the high calling of submitting to and loving your husbands. And please know that this calls for a certain level of discernment from you. You need to look for a godly woman who you want to emulate in her love for the Lord and her love to her husband. You wanna look for a woman who is willing to lovingly speak truth into your life and correct you when you're wrong. You wanna look for a woman who will not allow you to simply complain about your husband. Though I'm sure you have much to say in that area. Or could say, I should say. 
But you won't want to look for somebody who will put up with that. You'll want to have somebody that will instead help you to overcome that temptation to repay evil with evil and instead overcome that evil with good. Which leads to our fifth and final principle. I just want to give you some very practical suggestions and you can throw these out if you want to. But you give you some very practical suggestions from a husband. If you want to seek to overcome the evil and the errors and the shortcomings and the oversights and the blind spots of your husband. If you want to overcome that evil with good. Rapid fire list. This will be the fastest list yet. Here you go. Pray for him daily. I've already said that. James 5, speak words of kindness to him often. Surprise him with notes, with cards. Make him, if you really want to speak his love language, a special meal. (laughs) Make him a special meal intentionally. Give him an unexpected gift. Greet him with a hug and a kiss every time he walks through the door. Make him know that you are, that, he, that you treasure him. Often think of ways to thank him for the mundane good that he does for you, your family. Every couple of days, maybe pick one of his good character qualities and encourage him in it. Honey, I'm so thankful for that you do this. Here's a tough one. Confess your failures to him. Would you ever be willing to go to your husband and ask him honestly and humbly, honey, where could I do better? Where could I do better? Or are you convinced that what you're already doing is good enough? Reaffirm your commitment to him. All these things reaffirm your commitment to him, but I'm telling you, this will pour or should pour fuel onto his fire to lead you and to love you well. I want to encourage you to spend time with him for no other reason except for the fact that you enjoy his company. Hang out with him in the garage. Enjoy a drink together while he grills lemonade, of course. Tell him you want him to take you on a long drive, just you and him, so you can talk. Lastly, the last one. Obey God. And I'm telling you that when you obey God, you will show Christ to your husband. Because that's exactly the life that Christ lived. He came not to do his will, but the will of him who sent him. Wives, obey Christ, thereby showing Christ, giving him the love of the gospel, the grace of the gospel that you have experienced as a believer. And I'm telling you right now, ladies, the only agent that I know that brings lasting and effective transformation into a man's life is the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you want to give your husband the greatest gift you can give him, show him Christ with your life. Let's pray.